Thank you, everyone. It's really my pleasure to be here and sharing some thoughts with you on uh, what we observed previously in my work in the industry and now as consultant on the topic of how we advance this innovation no? and transform using the principles of Industry 4.0. And I want to particularly speak about the role that digital CMC can help in that transformation. So the, here are some of the ideas I'll be sharing. Um, first of all, I'm Gloria Gabriel Lopez, as I said. I work right now as consultant. I'm the head of the consultancy at Business Platforms that is based in Cork, Ireland. Prior to um, joining Business Platforms, I worked for another Irish company called ESP that was acquired by Accenture. So I was an Accenture employee for three years or so. But my, the bulk of my experience is from working directly in the industry. First at Genzyme, where I worked for about 15 years. I started my career there as a process engineer supporting multiple technology transfers and the build out of several facilities. And uh, later I worked at Shire, where I was the director of production and business systems. So in that capacity with my teams, we were supporting the implementation of various applications uh, for manufacturing, as well as comprehensive data and analytics for their uh, facilities. And one aspect of interest there is that one of the shared facilities was the first one that utilized uh, single-use technologies. So that made us think about how onboarding single-use was going to affect, how it was going to impact the configuration of all these operation systems, but also the data that were going to be required to onboard, qualify these materials, and also continue monitoring their performance through manufacturing. So we'll be speaking about that, you know, the operations and system, systems and data and analytics, share some thoughts on the current industry view, then we'll get into the discussion about how digital CMC can enable that transformation, some thoughts on achieving those, the strategic goals that we have as companies, sites, and facilities that manufacture these products, and realizing benefits and keys to success. So let's start with this. For context, no? we, talk, we heard early today about digital transformation under 4.0, and here this graphic illustrates what that progression looks like. It's one of the visuals, no? But I want to call your attention that this is usually divided in two parts, so this is my interpretation anyways. The first two blocks that you see on the bottom left there are the operation systems. It's where we capture the transactions from the process. No? This is where, for example, if we're using digital, well, if you're using MES, we have batch records, we are capturing the transactions from production. Or LIMS, when we are capturing the results from the results of the lab. Or an ERP, for example, where we are capturing all the planning and also the transactions about the material consumption. So those will be the ideas on the left side. But not all companies have implemented the systems. So we also need to think about all the paper-based methods that we have today in how we are gonna capture all these records and benefit from that wealth of information that we, are, that we have there, just sitting around in paper that haven't been properly utilized. And the right side where we have the blue uh, uh, bars is where we see that progression. And we see that we start with just understanding we see a trend. We observed that something happened. We saw that yield went up, or we saw that this property went down. But we really don't know necessarily why, but we start adding more data and doing more meaningful analysis when we see that may be some correlations, that something may have happened, that a property of a critical raw material change, and now we saw a result in a process, uh, in process performance or an attribute of the product. So as we're going up, in this uh, progression, we see now why something happened, what could have been done to prevent it, what if this is uh, envisioned, and now we know that if we introduce this change, this will result in such and such event. So those are the, they, those are the anticipated results of this progression. You know? And uh, also as guidance, we use the bioforum operation description of what is expected. So that table shows or illustrates some of those functionalities that we'll have as we move along those bars. And we also have additional uh, inspiration provided by uh, the um, ideas of knowledge management and quality by design from Bioforum. So let's start by talking about those first two bars that we saw there, the gray bars that discuss 
the operation systems. So this arrangement that we see here is inspired by the ISA 95 um, standard that discusses the arrangement of systems starting with the automation layer. And by the way, the level zero is the tanks, it's the actual equipment on the manufacturing floor. So the level one and two is where we find all the PLCs, all the automation and control. And then we start moving up. And in the middle layer in the level three is where we see manufacturing execution, limbs. We also see, for example, the system that we utilize for finite scheduling. We see the equipment management and all of that. And at the top layer is where we see ERP, all the quality management, training, and documentation. And also the space where we're seeing now technologies for serialization. Track and trace, that enables us to even connect across other facilities. But also um, we find the knowledge management space that is exactly the topic of this discussion. No? So we're gonna be spending some time looking into that too. But um, one of the characteristics of this landscape is that, well, it's organized, is guided by international standards. We connect and we create what we call the formal interfaces. That is the messaging that, cross, that goes across the systems. And uh, those interfaces are defined. And vendors make an effort because it's a plus for selling their product if they highlight that this system, for example, MES, can interface and they have evidence of use with, for example, connecting to ERP or to LIMS. So the flow and that very concerted execution is facilitated by those interfaces. What we're seeing too is that these are enabling data exchanges. We're sending data, for example, from MES to ERP, communicating how much material we consume for each one of the lots in the process. No? And in turn, ERP is adjusting the inventory. So now we're starting to see that we are capturing the data from this transaction, but also how if we are very deliberate and very uh, disciplined in how we structure our data landscape, now we can utilize that information. So let's look at that. So the, the arrangement on the right side is the structure of the data systems. So we hear, for example, about storage applications. We hear about display and visualization. But in reality, what we see is that the data landscape is formed by a conglomerate of applications. And we begin with those systems that I discussed before under ISA 95 as the sources that are feeding into this data landscape. So that's what forms that layer that we see at the bottom with the gray boxes. And moving up, what we see is sometimes technologies for master data management that are ensuring that we are aligning the data that we are collecting so that it can form meaningful data sets for analysis. And that master data management in advanced situations can be facilitated also by technology. Most commonly, what we see is that we are utilizing still manual systems, figuring out how to apply the governance at the point of collection of the data, but also after the fact when we are going to utilize the data prior to analysis. And in the next layers is where we see aggregation, when we are forming data sets that are combining data that came from various systems. And here is where, for example, if we want to see batch genealogy, we'll need to look at a table that has the lot number and everything that was consumed for that batch. Or if you want to see the effect of a raw material property on something else, we will have to look at the data from the provider, from the supplier of that raw material, and how that affected that property. So we'll start to see all these tables, how they start growing. But it had to be created on purpose so they can deliver that analysis that we want to achieve. And at the top layer is where we find the visualization. So here is where we have dashboards that can be very meaningful in showing for each particular group what they want to see. So in an advanced case, for example, quality could see all the reports that they need for load review and disposition. Or MTS, when they are doing a process investigation, could have a collection of all the trends and the analysis. You can have a defined, predefined folder with all your APQRs, for example. We can have 
all the um, pre-made regulations for uh, stability, all those kinds of things. So that's what we see in these dashboards at the top. But there are some challenges that we need to acknowledge. And the first one is that typically the systems are implemented as silos, and we heard some of that discussion earlier today, no? So there is no necessarily alignment and understanding of the required dependencies. So when we implement one of these operation systems, one of the typical cases is that we are not thinking ahead about how the data will be extracted on how it will be used, for example, to report data that was captured there. So that's one of the very typical, one of the common things that we find. The other one is that there is incomplete vision. Sometimes there is a vision that has not been shared or a lack of strategy for this digital transformation. So somebody thought about bringing a system that they saw at a conference that they liked, but it was not really thought about how it will fit in the rest of this operational systems landscape or a data system, what kind of functionality we'll be bringing and how we'll be completing that data landscape, no? The other one is validation, the approach to validation. Should we or should we not validate? Well, it depends on you know, how we want to use the data. And uh, all those discussions um, normally happen after the fact, and sometimes the vendors, the suppliers cannot support the validation because they don't provide sufficient documentation that can be leveraged, but does not acknowledge upfront. So another thing could be, for example, about uh, the reference data not available. So when we are going to implement, for example, MES, or the limbs, um, we don't find all that reference data. We may have difficulty justifying the ranges for a parameter. Or compiling all the elements of a bill of, of, a bill of materials, especially when you single use systems that the bill of material is enormous, no? How to compile all that information to have it in a place where we can go and access it when we are going to implement the systems. And uh, the practice of master data management that is not applied across all the functions that are gonna be providing data for future utilization. So an organization may have some ideas about how to implement that, but then over there you have probably an initiative in a, in a digital organization that is using a technology for master data management. And the group that is implementing the data management is using a manual approach. So they are not necessarily aligning. So here is where I would like to introduce then the idea of digital CMC as an enabler of that transformation, or at least one of the critical pieces. So this line diagram is not, or curve diagram, is not intended you know, to be shown a scale or anything, but really to highlight milestones in how some of the elements of product and process evolution are advancing. So in the beginning stages, you know, when you invent, when you envision this product and the platform that you're gonna utilize to make it, no? you are defining all your target quality profiles, you go into that incredible level of detail about defining that product. And in a similar way, you are also defining the process that you're going to utilize to manufacture it. So there is where you identify the equipment, what will be the unit operations that can achieve that product purity that I want to achieve. Is it gonna be chromatography? Is it gonna be a precipitation? Uh, when and how you filter it? And all those different things, no? Then you are also identifying materials and their properties, which is, who is the vendor that can provide this with the level of quality that you want? What kind of data are you gonna receive from these vendors and how you are going to qualify that material? And you are capturing all this information in paper, in some repositories somewhere, but the point is that as you are advancing and now you're gonna move on to a technology transfer when you are creating batch records or even better, when now you are thinking about maybe we should implement an ES or maybe we should be implementing LIMS and that would, that's the exact moment when it makes sense to create these batch records electronically. There is a very significant challenge in finding this reference information. And we always find that the client is scrambling during my own personal experience. No? Where can we find the justification for validation? When we know 
all of you who work in this space. This has been cataloged, this has been captured, this is known. And the other example is that when we are already um, manufacturing the product at the commercial scale, as you know, there will be cases where you need to investigate because something happened. And typically you see manufacturing quality and MTS, sharing ideas on how or what could have happened here. But the reality is that all the background, all that criticality and all that understanding of how these variables connect to each other and what influenced the product quality, the outcomes that you want, were developed already. And there are people who hold this knowledge and there is documentation that has been accumulated. But these groups are not necessarily speaking to each other. So what I want to say is that by collecting and classifying all this information and benefiting from digital CMC, we can facilitate the implementation of all these future systems. For example, where we capture the material data will inform the bills of material that goes into an ERP and MES, for example. The, all the discussion about analytical methods is going to help us, it's going to inform how LIMS is going to be configured, no? And then we have all the scope of digital CMC that continues to capture the history of this evolution and continues into the future, capturing how the product and the process will be changing because it's the reality, you know, these processes will continue to change and we still need to manage that change. So what are the benefits that we realize? Well, first of all, if we are disciplined and we utilize good principles, we can reuse this approach for multiple products, especially if we're gonna be using a platform. And that's what I want to connect, you know, the repeatability of this process as, uh, and the platform principle. Also, we repeat it across sites. We make the same product, for example, at CMOs or our own internal sites. So there is also the aspect of repeatability of the process itself, no? We can expedite the validation by collecting that information, and we know that it can serve as the foundation for knowledge management. That is something that today is not necessarily solid, is not a discipline that we see you know, that is easy to implement. We can always, as we say, we're always scrambling for that. So I wanted to mention now some of the keys to success. Uh, obviously, guide the implementation of digital CMC with business processes. When I spoke about that ISA 95 landscape of systems, that is not invented or implemented in a vacuum. That is really based on the activity model of ISA 95. That is the real world of how we bring materials into a facility, how we create, make the product, how we take samples and we send them to the labs, how we track the equipment that was participating in the process. So in reality, the activity model and that ISA 95 landscape is showing us a network of business processes that are all working together. And we need to be mindful of that alignment. Emphasizing the collaboration across functions. We already heard some thoughts about that in the morning. No? And uh, implement harmonized principles, for example, master data management, and define those clear validation approaches, as we said before. So I want to come back to this discussion that we had in the morning. We heard about the challenge about the legacy systems and what can we do to improve that situation. Well, and is that that point that they have there? That is establish formal methods for the vendor and application selection and ensuring that we are delivering the expected functionality. The reason why we create so much customization is because the systems did not deliver the expected functionality. And because we need to, as they said, get this product out the door, we are gonna do whatever it takes to keep those records. So if the system is not delivering that functionality, we are going to put together some Excel table or something on the side that we keep in a control SharePoint where we are gonna keep these additional records. And typical example will be where we cannot really properly track the consumption of raw materials in ERP, so we keep a record on the side and then at the end of the day or at the end of the week, somebody takes the Excel and enters the right data into ERP. So the way that we can mitigate that, I was thinking this morning is that, well, we can use the opportunity to upgrade the system 
and the next time we implement a new version of that application, we do an upfront study. We do an upfront assessment where we collect formally the user requirements, listening to all the participants, all the stakeholders, and we plan how we are going to do that deployment, acknowledging that sometimes systems have limitations and we are not gonna be able to deliver 100% of all the required functionality. Or making sure that through the validation process, if that is a requirement, we are looking very seriously at how those URSs, what those requirements were delivered. And we don't accept in a user acceptance test something that was insufficient. And that's something that we suffer as organizations because we feel pressure. And you know examples when we have even celebrated that a system was deployed when in reality they didn't have all the functionality that was required. So I want to go back and I don't want to say thank you yet until I summarize here. Yeah, we want to make sure that we are documenting the vision for a future state and that we share it. That we create a culture that promote, promotes digital technology and CMC and that collaborates internally and externally. If you remember from that diagram that I showed, that arrangement of the ISA 95 operation systems doesn't apply only at one site. We make products using networks of CMOs and internal facilities. So the challenges of this data acquisition are not just particular to one site. We need to think about the totality of all the sources of data, including the external lab, the testing facilities, and the suppliers of the raw materials that can give us all the certificates of analysis data or anything in useful form. And then, um, obviously, we need to think about the development of that internal knowledge, having groups internally that know how to implement digital CMC, that are the central glue you know, that brings together all these different participants and the stakeholders that together are going to ensure that the application is successful and that it delivers the ambition uh, functionalities. And we see digital CMC as the cornerstone for that, no? because it's the original holder of all the data that connects the product and the product evolution informs how the other systems are implemented, but also allows us to utilize the data in meaningful ways, and that's how we learn more about what makes the process work and how we get the product that we want. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna talk about concepts and use cases for the rollout of QB Division that we had at Bayer. Um, and yeah, just to show you the agenda first, um, I'm first gonna talk about general concepts that we put in place for deployment, uh, a taxonomy, and also touch on new modalities, uh, where then my colleagues, uh, Amol and Justin, are gonna talk about that in another call in the afternoon. Um, and then I have three, prepared three case studies where you can pick and choose from which one you wanna hear uh, about more. So one is about scoping uh, of process characterization in QB division, which is a little bit more high level, talking about our risk approach. Uh, then uh, one is about performing tech transfer and one about creating a process description. Um, and we can do a quick vote after I uh, showed you the general concept slides uh, and then we can just pick and choose. All right, moving on. So how do you implement a new knowledge management tool, right? We heard about it, uh, a lot about that um, today uh, and also yesterday, right? And we thought, okay, we need uh, certain prerequisites because before we can actually uh, implement one, right? So one idea was to come up with a training portal with a lot of videos where people can actually go to to educate themselves, right? Because I think the, the new way of how to consume information is by using uh, YouTube and so on. So we move away a little bit from just text-based information to make it more available for people. Uh, and that comes along with uh, the user levels that certain people wanna have in QB division, so they need to see a certain set of videos in the end. What we also wanna create is success stories, right? So we wanna make sure that people uh, understand what the software can do and where it actually the payoff comes and hashtag case study. So this is the, the, the presentations I have uh, at the back of the presentation. 
Uh, and then we also put best practices in place because QB division allows you, or gives you a lot of degrees of freedom on how to put information. And we want to make sure that this information is structured and we, we have for certain uh, records in the software uh, certain fields that need to be filled so that we have a certain standards that we want to keep. Then also, also what you want to have, and we touched on that also in the morning in the discussion, is a certain binding uh, framework in the organization. So we have also SOPs and we try to make it more and more mandatory to use the software and go away from the Excel. And then you go to the project team, of course, and you start to talk about the usage. And what you also want to do, of course, is ease the usage of the software. So what we do is we come in with a, with a team um, uh, to support the initial heavy lifting to, to start using QB Division and then give it away to the project team afterwards. Uh, we also want to fixate an entry point, so each project is in a different state, right? And uh, you, you want to uh, fix that where you actually start using the software. For us, it's now with transfers. Usually, I think it's a natural entry point to, to go into QB Division. And then we individually train the users to, to use the software and just keep it to a certain level where we don't overburden SMEs with, with trainings. Talking about that, we have certain user levels. Um, so we have six different ones. We have the admin and the super user caretaker, which are usually data steward, uh, or, and then the caretaker could be a student or a full-time FTE uh, to do the heavy lifting at the beginning. Uh, and they usually receive all the training so that they actually really know what they're doing. Then we have a super user in the project team that is also um, highly educated in the, in the software that actually uh, is responsible that all the information is going to end up in QB division in the end. And then um, we have the standard user in the project teams that are just there, I mean, we're supposed to enter their results uh, or get the information that they're looking for. Uh, and with that comes a light specific training so that they actually can accomplish that. We have also a prover uh, so for QA and a viewer uh, accounts that we use for management so that they can actually see what's going on, which comes also with light specific trainings. So uh, yeah, then I have this picture um, you, you see here. So if you don't want your ship to sink, right, uh, the software rollout to sink, you want to avoid the big waves, right? So we heard about that a lot in the morning as well, right? So we try to make the waves smaller, right? <laughs> uh, the idea is to really go in three waves. I'm showing here the first two ones because we are in the second wave right now. So the first is really we come in with the uh, software specialists, with the caretaker, with the admin, into the project team. We support whatever they're doing right now. We bring it into the software so that they don't have to do more on their daily basis, right? And then we, what we also want to do is we recreate the experience that they have with Word and Excel so that the change is not that big, right? We also heard that today, right, that even though we have these old tools, right, it can be good to just utilize them to a certain extent because the people are familiar. Uh, and then we do roadshow, we emphasize the benefits for the SMEs, and this is really the, the idea to everything feels a little bit the same like before, we have this easy transition, and the first two case studies are going to talk about that a little bit. Then we have the second wave, right, we have uh, the, we sit back with the, with the individual SMEs and then just ask them like what's missing now so that you feel comfortable using the software moving on, right? And then the idea is that the SMEs then start updating their projects just in the software and see it as the main repository for the evaluation or the, the progression of this project. I do the risk assessment, do the process description and so on. Then you can actually start copying this process if you have a platform in place, right, and reuse it. And then the, the payoff is going to start, right? And this is really where we are right now. And the main driver or the, mo the most important thing is really to create this re responsibility with the end user, right? I think this, this is also something that came out today a lot in the, in the discussions. Uh, and we also put a, a sustainability um, concept in place uh, where we have three big pillars, the one being end-to-end, uh, -end. so uh, in terms of our uh, data continuum, the other one is um, make it attractive, have a lot of benefits for the end users, right? And the third one, providing support from the organization side so that this software is really um, a good one. 
right? So, and I put a lot of stuff in gray um, because I already talked about it, and I just want to highlight some stuff here in blue. So from the end-to-end -end perspective, what we have is that we embed the workflows in the uh, data capturing, and we connect it to our data continuum. Right, so this software needs to be integrated. The second one is we want to also co-develop new features with QB Division, so to make it better, to make it more, uh, more attractive for the end users. So here we, we for example, developed this tech transfer feature that m some of you are already using uh, two years ago with QB Division, which is, a, I think, a huge step uh, for us as well to standardize this. Uh, so hashtag case study two, so <laughs> if you're interested. Uh, and then also from the support side from Bayer, what we also try to put in place is a controlled vocabulary so that all the information that once correctly entered is um, the same throughout the ecosystem. All right, looking at the data continuum, um, the digital CMC solution is for us one of the central solutions um, that we have in our uh, landscape. Uh, there's also a lot of, uh, on the left and the right, so we have the taxonomy in place for the controlled vocabulary, and then we have also, I mean, each of these puzzle pieces you see is basically a different software solution that we have. Uh, we have something for the development lab, we have uh, software for the manufacturing side, right? Uh, we have data capture, uh, so data historians and so on. We want to make sure that all the software solutions we are implementing can consume our platform, right? And then we can also, as long as we are not staying in a validated software, able to export all the information put into our validated documentation system, at least at the beginning, right? So this is the upper part of this. All right, uh, yeah, talking about taxonomy, I just quickly want to touch on that, right? So how do we standardize data? Here you can see a lot of variety around how uh, the loading density for unit operation could be described. There's various units and various namings that are out there that are used, right? So you want to standardize that, right? And to do that, you put the, the terms into uh, domains. So for example, I'm showing here uh, on the left-hand side the equipment domain that we have that contains then process equipment, and within that are the bioreactors. Everything's defined. In the end, everything gets a number that makes it machine readable, right? And this enables also to make the data searchable in the end. So this is really a fundamental thing you need to have in place to really structure all the information you're capturing. And if I then look at the framework that we have for our normal modalities, basically at the bottom we have the the platform with all the information you've been collecting over the last years that usually resides with the SMEs, right? And then what we did, we built on top of that uh, a layer of best practices, so really how to execute uh, uh, certain things, like with detailed instructions. Then the next layer for us is the taxonomy, where we standardize the information that we capture. And then on top of that, of all of that, where everything comes together, we have this knowledge management tool as a central solution, right? Where, where all this information is going to be fed in, right? And then if you think on, on new modalities, right, this basis that I described uh, is missing, right? Because there's not a lot of experience out there, so you want to build this platform, right? And the idea is really to build this platform into the knowledge management tool right away and don't even start to have the information reside with the SMEs anymore, right? And then you can update the best practices so that the people know what to do, specific for the new modality. You can extend the taxonomy, and then you have everything already in one central solution and can build this platform from uh, onwards in, in a software. Okay, and with that, we are at the case study level. So um, again, the process characterization part has a little higher flight height. That's where we have the little um, planes there describing our risk approach that we usually take. Uh, then I have one on the tech transfer, maybe not so interesting anymore because I, we talked about it a lot in the breakout session already, uh, and I revealed a lot of stuff that I have on the slides. And then we have creating of the process description, which is really down in the details of how we um, try to recreate a Word document that we had in QB Division and then generate it out of the software. So maybe can I get some hands what people want to see? Because I can only show one of those uh, because I have eight minutes left. Um, so uh, who wants process description? One, two, three. All right. Uh, who's for tech transfer? Who's for process characterization? Oh God, it's almost equal. I don't know. I mean, and one thing maybe, what's going to be driving the decision is, uh, tomorrow we're going to see new features from QB Division, so I, I would recommend looking at process descriptions. <laughs> is that okay? 
with everyone? All right, I'm gonna share the slide decks. You can look at all the other ones. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's almost equals, like 10 each or something, I don't know. All right? Okay, I'm just gonna continue. Um, all right, process description, good selection. Um, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the first case study. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the problem statement. Uh, I'm gonna put it out there. We have also then the setup, so the recreation of a Word document, so hashtag wave one. And then I'm gonna talk about the challenges and benefits that we see doing it in QB Division right now. So the problem actually about the process description is that it's really time consuming. It's the creation, also the versioning of these kind of documents is really, really uh, intensive in terms of review because it's happening in a non-validated environment in Excel or Word, right? And with that comes uh, a lot of people having to check all the values, right? Another thing is that the Word documents themselves are limited in space, right? And usually you have big tables and you cannot really display everything properly, so what, what ends up happening is you have uh, two tables showing the same information, at least partially, and then there's another um, uh, option to make mistakes, right? And uh, also the source information, and we heard that also, like, it's a vast number of documents coming from development, the risk assessment from the transfer, this kind of stuff, that all needs to come together, so there's another chance to do a lot of mistakes. So initially, we come in again with the, with the team um, of super users and, and admins to do the heavy lifting at the beginning. So the idea is we have a best practice in place, how a process description is supposed to look like, right? And we transcribe first all the information that is in the, in the Word document into upload spreadsheets for, Q, for QB Division. And here, for the first time, we want to make sure that all the information we enter complies with the taxonomy that we have in place. What happens then is we upload it into QB Division, we export it again, right? And uh, then we recreate this Word document that's supposed to comply to then both the best practice and the taxonomy for the first time. So that takes a lot of time, right? For the, but the idea is for the next time you're gonna be much quicker, right? So you have project A here, right? So one scenario is you have a new process version, so you can create a copy of that and then just use the upload spreadsheets or manual entries to adjust that. You can do the assessment on the change that you did between the process version, nice. Right, so the other option is you copy it for plan, uh, project B, right? So again, you have another platform project in place uh, and you again can change uh, everything with the upload spreadsheets or the manual entries. I recommend the manual entries because it saves you one data check, so no one has to look at another Excel spreadsheet before uh, you upload it into the system, uh, so you also save some time here. But of course, it depends on the number of changes, I would say. <laughs> um, and then when we look at the upload spreadsheets, uh, we expect that a certain, the product-related information is already in the software, and then you have the process description relevant uh, uploads that I'm highlighting here on the left side in green, basically, so the parameters, materials, equipment, all this kind of stuff, right? And um, what you might notice when you look at the table in the middle of the page is that we're using metadata, right? So this is an exemplified list of, material, um, of equipment that we put in, and this is all metadata from our taxonomy that makes QB division highly adaptable between projects, so, so we can easily upload changes or uh, apply changes to the software, uh, but the main names of everything stay the same. Then what you also wanna do is you bring in as much as possible the platform knowledge that you already have, right? So may it be failure modes, literature, whatever, right? So that you build it into the software as much as possible so that this copying of the process for the next time um, brings as much value as possible. And then what we also want to implement is the S88 standard, um, so for process control and batch, uh, batch control, basically, which um, segregates the process into process, process stages, process operation, and actions. Uh, um, QB Division actually lacks this process stage level, so uh, I'm showing here for the drug substance process in the middle, basically how we uh, put the data into the system, so usually the materials and components reside with the unit operation, where parameters and sampling and, and in-process controls are with the steps, right? And for buffer and media preps, we do it a little bit different, uh, and I'm gonna show you later why, uh, so what actually happens is that we put the process components on the highest level because all the buffers are done with the same equipment. Um, and then 
uh, most of the information is going into the step limit, like the materials, parameters, and sampling, and so on. And yeah, here's basically why. So we want to make use of this flow maps that QB Division provides in the best possible way. Uh, and we want to also make this buffer preparation as um, independent of the process as possible, right? So we have here in the middle, you see component edition one, two, three, right? Um, and actually, we can define what component is actually being added by just selecting a different material and just changing that, right? And then in the record itself, itself you can actually then also define, like for example here, this what feed powder are we actually using? So that makes it also very flexible to changes between the projects, and the information is still there. Then also we want to dis display the process in the best possible way. As said, we don't have this process stage level in QB Division that we would like to have, so we put all the information with the process. So we put the side, uh, is it the SDP, the process version, and then what part of drug, drug substance for, for example, is it? Is it buffer prep? Is it upstream, downstream? Um, and here are two examples I'm showing in the middle. Then we have the introduction of, uh, of text-based information that we usually also have in process description that, that go into the description fields um, for the process and the unit operations so that we can also, again, export that. Uh, so I'm showing that here in the, in the middle bottom. Um, and then what we also wanted to create in, in QB Division, what it doesn't have, is a sampling plan, right? So the, the problem here is usually you have multiple measurements coming out of one sample, so you, I cannot put it into the IQA section because there I have already the measurements. So we thought, okay, let's make this all materials. Uh, so we're creating materials for every sample that we generate, um, and then we try to um, put all the information that are required for sampling somewhere with the, uh, with the sample, with the material. So like quantities, there's fields for quantities, but we're also hijacking some fields for, I don't know, capturing the storage temperature, the vials, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and that's basically um, the, uh, the overview of the, the process um, description. So now I'm gonna talk about the challenges on, and um, here still what we see is that we have to export a vast number of tables out of the software to ge actually generate back a Word document that we can sign then. So usually it's like 40 tables or something like that. And with that comes also that you make, want to make sure these are still the latest version and this, this kind of stuff. You have to do a little reformatting before you can actually use them in the style that we needed to. So this is really time consuming still for us. Um, then another challenge that we discussed uh, a lot this morning was also the uh, creation of responsibility with the people so that they actually take over these tasks once this, this force coming in from the side, like helping, setting stuff up, is leaving. Right? So you want to make sure that this is also happening. And then there's also certain technical limitations in the software. Like with the flow diagrams, we, for example, we cannot display everything. We, we, we cannot show simultaneous processes or optional processes or cycling, kind, kind of stuff that we would like to have in the future. Um, also the sampling plan is some kind of workaround. It's, it works, but still now the material samples are all over the place uh, with the other materials and that we don't like so much. And of course, the text that we put in and uh, export out doesn't have formatting. So that's also for us uh, a challenge and creates more work. But looking on the plus side, right, so this is small stuff uh, in the end, at, um, what I uh, mentioned last, is we have a platform in a software, we can reuse it, we can template a lot, right, so hashtag wave two. Uh, we can have templating, we have the audit trail in place, we have the option to validate the software whenever we want to. Uh, we have an easy review option in the software. We have no space limitations, basically. And uh, all the information should be already in there if you did the transfer in QB Division, right? So there's not a lot of setup to create a process description document uh, once the information is already in there. So the payoff comes if you really use it for multiple tasks. And then th thinking about the future, right, so where we want to be is that QB division is the process definition, right? So we don't even need to create a process description document anymore because the whole purpose of it is that you have one place to go to where uh, the truth is in, right? But if you have a system that provides you with that, you don't need it, right? Uh, yeah, and with that, I thank you very much. And um, who's next? <laughs> So well, thank you for allowing me to talk here and share our experiences with QB Division at Sonovi's mRNA Center of Excellence. What I want to really talk about today 
is how we're using QBD Vision and how we intend to use it. Some of this is forward looking. Some of this is stuff that we're starting to put in place now. We really want to be able to use it and leverage kind of this platform mRNA manufacturing approach to accelerate our timelines for CMC. Um, so, you know, what I want to talk about today, I'm going to do a quick introduction, um, talk about really how the mRNA Center of Excellence came to be at Sanofi and really what our areas of focus on. This is a relatively new business unit. Um, mRNA is, is a new technology that uh, really has been put to the forefront, especially with the pandemic. And um, Sanofi started this new business unit, and I want to really show how we, we were really formed and what we're focusing on over the past year and how we want to apply that platform manufacturing approach and some of the benefits and challenges that, that we're experiencing. So this is me, my favorite topic I'm going to talk about first is myself. So I'm currently the Director of Manufacturing Sciences, like I said, it's an OFI Manufacturing, uh, the mRNA Center of Excellence. Um, most of my career I spent really around manufacturing, um, or process engineering, really um, I enjoy manufacturing process, it's something I really, um, you know, really drives me. I really like to understand how things work. And, um, so I spent a lot of time doing you know, a lot of projects with facility design, doing startups. Um, and, and systems implementations. I, I was on an SAP project as a manufacturing SME, um, which was crazy. This is how I met Gloria uh, 10 years ago. She knows exactly where I'll be when we went live on that date, which was quite an experience. Um, I've done other um, systems implementations to support manufacturing, like uh, finite scheduling um, application, which was really kind of changed the tra trajectory of my career into this kind of foray with mom um, dealing with systems and how they apply to manufacturing. I did have the pleasure, uh, full disclosure, I worked at QBD Vision. I was the director of client services here for a year. Actually was here, not, not this hotel, but in Austin three years ago when I started for our, our retreat. That was the last retreat that we had before the pandemic, but um, you know, it was an exciting time for me. This was, I learned a lot. Uh, we were Cherry Circle Software at the time, and um, it was really, really a great experience. So you know, I appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, so where, where does the story begin? Um, so it begins at a company called Translate Bio. So when, while I was at uh, Cherry Circle, we signed Translate Bio on for a six month pilot. Yash loves his pilot projects. We, and what Translate Bio wanted to do in QBD Vision, we had, they had a, um, a partnership with Sanofi to um, advance a COVID vaccine um, using mRNA technology. And that's what Translate Bio was, a small company based out of Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, the focus was on mRNA. We had multiple, they had multiple projects going on at the same time, working on a flu vaccine, a treatment for cystic fibrosis, and they partnered with Sanofi to, um, to advance the um, you know, mRNA COVID vaccine. Um, while we were working with them, an opportunity came up for me at Translate Bio as director of um, Manufacturing Sciences, I, I jumped on that opportunity because I could see that this was a, a fast-growing company. It was exciting work to be in that mRNA, um, mRNA, mRNA field. And when I started there, like I like to say, it was like boarding a moving train. Things were moving fast. We had multiple programs in, in, in the flight. Um, this, this pilot with, with QBD Vision was something that I had started as QBD Vision, and I wanted to continue from the Translate Bio side. Um, and we all know, you know, we all know what happened with the um, mRNA uh, vaccine. You know, spoiler alert, Pfizer and, and Moderna were really the first ones to bring it to market, so we ended up uh, obviously losing that race, but what it did was it showed that this mRNA talk technology was a real, the real deal. This was something that was um, something that has a lot of promise in the industry. So Sanofi saw that. They acquired Translate Bio about a year ago, and in the process created this new, this new mRNA center of excellence. So, this is a relatively new business unit. We're, we're in the vaccines uh, function, and um, you know, Translate Bio in Lexington, Massachusetts, merged with Sanofi Pasteur, which was in Lyon. We combined, and, and mRNA Center of Excellence was born. And at the same time, we were moving from Lexington into Waltham, Massachusetts, which was about five miles away. And Sanofi was in the process of rebranding to this one, one Sanofi thing. So that's why the two logos are on the screen, in case you were wondering. So mRNA Center of Excellence is, is born. Uh, we have multiple locations. So we have locations in Lyon, France, which is at the Marcy Le Trois site. Uh, like I said, in Waltham, Massachusetts, which is where I'm located. Uh, we have some satellite offices in Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, uh, Toronto, and Orlando. So we're, we have multiple sites. And we're grown like crazy over the past year. We're at over 400 people right now 
and we're targeting somewhere around 450. Uh, so we're still hiring, we're still bringing on new people, and, um, and it's very exciting. It's an exciting place to be. And our focus is we obviously dropped the, um, the COVID vaccine um, from, the, from the portfolio. The main focus right now is on a quadrivalent uh, flu vaccine. So we're preparing to go into phase three clinical trials for that next year. We're working on RSV, and acne is something that is in our pipeline as well. And we recognize that the mRNA has potential for other areas of therapeutics. Um, so we've been talking to um, the, some of the global, global medicinal units and you know, potential use for um, mRNA for oncology as well. And like I said, this is crazy. When I thought we were on a, you know, you know, boarding a moving train before, this really has been like a bullet train. So we really have picked up speed. We've accelerated our activities, and, um, and it's really a very exciting place to be. So well, the main area of focus is here for us, really three things, building the new organization. Like I said, we've more than doubled in size over the past year, so we've got a lot of new people. Uh, we've got integration activities that are happening between you know, Translate Biosystems and, and Sanofi Systems, new ways of working and new roles and responsibilities. And at the same time, we also still have a critical need to advance these high priority programs like the Quad Flu and the RSV program. And we're, we're working on um, tech transfer right now to uh, put that Quad Flu vaccine into a, a CMO. At the same time, part of this mRNA um, center of excellence, we do have a function for data sciences. So this is, you know, there's a huge push for digitization um, at the mRNA center of excellence. So a lot of that, when we came from Translate Bio, Translate Bio was a small company. Um, a lot of the focus was on really advancing the programs, doing the experiments, getting the data, really zero focus on managing that data at all. So when I started at um, Translate Bio, one of my first areas of focus was really to kind of get this data out of PDFs, so everything was on PDFs everywhere, put it into a, a table and really start to put some structure around it and verify that so when people needed to do their analysis, they weren't spending weeks and weeks getting that data together and, and really could focus on what they need to do. So that is something that we're still working on and something we're still putting into place. And at the same time, there's a master data governance that needs to happen and we're still implementing systems um, around that. So the platform approach, to, platform approach to CMC. So how is that gonna help us with all of those priorities? And, and the idea here is that mRNA process um, really for each program follows the same sort of process. You know, we have an IVT reaction, but then we do a capping and tailing, we do some purification, we generate the mRNA, <clears throat> we put it, we go through a lipid nanoparticle process um, and, 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 you know, as a delivery system, and then we do final filtration, and, it, and it's ready to go for, for, fill and filtrate, for uh, final fill and, and packaging. So this process is really the same process, you know, from program A to program B, so it should be very easy to kind of create this platform to be able to leverage that, that knowledge for, for the next process. It doesn't always happen that way. With a lot of, um, you know, especially merging companies, there's a lot of differences with how things are um, done in France, with how things were done in Waltham. So there's some, you know, inconsistencies that are happening. So the idea here is that we create this kind of platform project and we feel like QPD Vision is really a great system for us to leverage to be able to do that efficiently. So the idea here is that we create a, this kind of baseline um, project, and we started doing that in Excel, um, and we're, we're, trans we're moving that into QBD Vision, to, and this was based on one of our in-flight programs already, where we have identified our final quality attributes, we've done our criticality assessments, we defined our process, equipment, steps, any materials that we use, and done our criticality assessment for our process, and started to define our control strategy. So that would be our baseline for this in-flight program, and the idea is that we would clone that, and we started to do this and, and make a platform project out of, out of that. And, and Yashka talked a little bit about the platform project, which I think is a great idea. I love it. Um, some of the platform, um, well, some of the, some of the attributes and some of the you know, process parameters aren't all going to be platform-based. Some of them are program-specific. So we're reviewing our platform project at QBD Vision and pulling out any program-specific attributes and making sure that we have just one platform that can apply across multiple projects. Um, and the idea is that the criticality assessment is done on these attributes, the, um, and also the, the parameters. The um, unit operations are defined, and, and so the next time we start a new program, we have a, a really good knowledge base that we could use to, and, and um, you know, add in any, any new target product profile information or any 
program-specific information for that new project. We still would need to review criticality, sections, criticality assessments, make sure they still apply to the new program, but it really gives us a, a better starting point than if we were to sort of recreate the wheel here. Um, so the idea is that you know, speed is key, and taking this platform approach is, is going to you know, accelerate some of the timelines of, of our CMC. Um, and you know, these, these timelines here are really sort of loosely based in reality, but where we're looking at doing you know, process definition and, and product definition, process definition, and defining control strategy over the course of five to six months, we're really looking to, hope to cut that timeline almost in half. Um, so that's one of the benefits that we would get from creating and using this platform approach. Um, the other thing, and, and Yashka talked a bit about this, is, is kind of harmonization of um, some of these attribute naming. Um, this has been a pain point at Translate Bio and, and the mRNA Center of Excellence at Sanofi for a while. When we started to you know, do this data management project, um, you know, we noticed that you know, this uh, example I use here for capping percentage. Capping percentage is an example of something that would be a platform um, attribute. And when we pulled our data set, well, this is years worth of data, that we see capping percentage named so many different times. And if we wanted to pull that attribute and look across the platform to see you know, how, how is our capping percentage um, you know, doing, how is our process performing, we really needed to know that these seven different names for capping percentage in order to do that. So one of the first things that we have did, we've gone in and we've had to manually kind of map capping percentage to a, to a um, harmonized name. Uh, but we see that if we use a platform approach, you know, that's kind of a way that we can help drive some of that, that naming convention standardization, not only with just attribute names, but also with unit operation definition. If we want to look at a yield for a specific step, we want to make sure that the starting and end point of that step is, is consistent. So we're comparing apples to apples when, and you know, again, platform, this platform approach can help, help drive that. And when we do this, we recognize that a platform project is something that's gonna to need to be maintained over time. So any, any changes, this is a living kind of document. This is a living example of what your, your latest version of knowledge is. And uh, so any process changes that happen, any material changes, we, we have any kind of revisit criticality analysis, or we do wanna change some of that, um, some of those naming conventions, this has to be fed back into the platform project. So the new, any new programs that start are based on that latest version of what our knowledge base is. So really, really to summarize, like, we really can achieve a lot of different benefits from um, taking this platform approach, but we really have to define um, you know, business processes to do this. Who's gonna, who's gonna own it? Um, how, how are people gonna use this? And you know, it's really the people that are, that are gonna be doing this work. And, and without properly defining who's gonna do it and how it's gonna get used, it doesn't get done. Um, so you know, some of these benefits really to never leverage this knowledge to make our CMC timelines go faster. Um, we can also help drive the, this, this harmonization of unit operations and harmonization of attribute naming. That way we'll have a better kind of vision of, of our data set across the platform so we can better understand how our process is performing and, and make, make those um, updates that we need to do. Um, and, and then also keep, keep that updated as well. And I have to talk about challenges, you know, the, you know. When I think about the challenges for, you know, how to implement these types of systems, especially at a new organization, um, I can put them into really three buckets. And really, one of them is is that we have immature systems and we have an immature organization. Version one of our organization, there was a lot of um, a lot of people not really knowing who who does what. A lot of overlap, a lot of gaps. So I feel like we've streamlined a lot of those. That, you know, roles and responsibilities over the last year or so. Um, and with the systems, you know, you talk about 4.0, I'd be happy if we were at 0.4 right now because people love, love their Microsoft Office. They love their Excel. They love their PDFs. They love Word. Um, and, and, and we talked, you know, we heard about this earlier today that the systems implementations, they get done in silos. And, you know, to be able to kind of harmonize across those silos makes it very, very challenging. And if you don't do that up front, to go back and, and do it is, is even more difficult. Um, and then there's a general lack of understanding what QBD vision is, um, especially from the, our IT group. So if there's any IT folks in the audience, I apologize, but they are always trying to character, you know, characterize it as a system. Um, you know, some people think it's a document management system. Some people think that it's a uh, data management system. And it's 
all of those things, and there's more, but it, people don't really seem to kind of understand that because it's such a unique piece of software. Um, another challenge that we've had, and I know we're not the only company that has this challenge, is resource conflicts. Um, you know, people are under a lot of pressure to meet their timelines for the CMC, and, and learning a new software really doesn't, isn't built into that timeline. So when, when they have to learn something new and still meet their goals, what they're going to do is default back to their ways of working, which is, which is always Excel. It's always kind of those old ways of doing things. And, and so it's really difficult to kind of get that baked into um, to a CMC program. And then some growing pains. Like go back to that train analogy. We feel like we're laying the tracks as we're speeding along on it. So we're still building business processes. Um, and, and being also you know, half located in France and half located in the US, you know, be, having that multiple locations can, can build its own challenges in. And it's a real thing, the language barrier, um, you know, the French teams call um, criticality assessments something completely different. So there's a, there's a total language barrier that we need to overcome, which we're doing. Um, and I know folks at QBD Vision know what it's like to have multiple locations, so we're managing it. It's just you know, some of the things that we're, we're still getting used to. And, um, but anyway, I want to thank you all for listening, and I really want to thank the folks at QBD Vision for allowing me to share our experiences here and, and talk about um, you know, how, we're, how we're trying to leverage QBD Vision and to improve our business processes. So thank you. What it is we're trying to do is uh, deal with code. Uh, and code that is done in computers today is based on binary systems. And we've been able to do incredible things, mathematical calculations, they talk about the devices that are in all of our pockets being much more complex than what took us to the moon. Uh, but of course, uh, it gets more, more and more complex. Uh, what Artisan Bio is trying to do is start dealing with another bit of code, which is the biological base code of DNA. So we are uh, trying to bring the premise of gene editing to the masses, if possible. And we do that through uh, what we call uh, a cell foundry. So we have a system in place uh, that is built to use CRISPR-based technology to do gene editing, uh, which also allows freedom to operate within the IP space in the safest manner possible. Uh, so our novel CRISPR tool of Star CRISPR 1.0 evolution every year uh, to 2.0 next year, uh, and also associated apps applications of, of what to do with this uh, application, uh, this operating system are a tested platform really directed towards gene and cell therapies, which is the new novel way of uh, pr presenting drugs to the world. Uh, and we also have a candidate pipeline, which we've put on break to develop our platform. Um, so this is our approach to doing the CASA, the Knowledge Assisted Assessment and structured approach to making decisions around uh, safe, making safe gene editing uh, decisions. So we do multiple iterations of in silica calculations based on the DNA sequence that we're trying to edit, as well as the gene, um, the, the guide sequences that we choose to do the editing. We then do it in sort of wet chemistry form and run these sort of things on naked DNA. We analyze that genomic sequence uh, again, through another sequence of, of software packages. And then we iterate it in sort of a more complex fashion when we talk about the tertiary structures of the DNA. And so we have developed a series of software. The names are cute, little animals here. We had Ascot, Mantis, uh, Rampy, Ampeter, and uh, Highcap. And these are all sort of a sequence of our structured approach to make these uh, sort of knowledge-assisted assessments of what is safe. We align that against the uh, latest uh, FDA guidance in this world, uh, and we check all the boxes. But we, of course, do a lot more than what's just available on that FDA timeline. Um, and we've also uh, tried to embrace this idea of digital transformation with our product line. So we talk about our products as being operating systems. So the operating system is the ability to do this editing. And we'll give it to all of our, our customers uh, as part of their entry into the uh, um, sort of operating system that we uh, offer to our com cu customers. So our first operating system is around T cells. And doing T cell editing is hot topic. This is an area that has a lot of development, but of course a lot of risks involved as well. Primary cells are harder to culture after they've been uh, optimized. But our system has got high efficiency, 
to do the editing, uh, both knock in and knock out. A knock out is turning off of a gene, a knock in is turning on a gene of interest to make some expression of proteins that are desirable. Um, and here we have uh, our, our outline. So the nuclease is really our operating system and the guides are our apps. The guide selection is really gonna tell you what it is you're gonna do, whether you're doing a knockout or a knock-in. And our knockouts are meant to hopefully hide these drugs, these cell-based drugs from the human immune system that could tackle and get rid of the efficacy. Uh, the durability is always a challenge when it comes to cell-based uh, products. Um, so trying to hide from your own immune system for as long as possible to get that maximal uh, medical benefit is part of interest, and the knock-ins are something that our customers are really more interested in than us. Uh, we have our own candidates that are on the back burner right now, but we have opportunity to do some custom editing in that sense. So we have ready-to-go apps for knockouts, and then uh, along with those, those apps, uh, we have also our data packs, our guide sequence data packs, which is a based a bit of our sort of story that can be used in a regulatory filing perfectly matched with our QBD vision software implementation to allow for the quick uh, formation of our regulatory filings, uh, which backs up not only the uh, methods and materials, but also talks about our licensing opportunities as well. Our second operating system is around IPSCs. So the editing of IPSCs is a challenge, uh, but opens up a lot of opportunities as well. It's harder to do this kind of editing, so we don't get the high efficiencies that we did out of T cells. I think we will get better efficiencies as, as time goes on. Uh, but again, we have an operating system with add-on apps to knock out certain things that we know are probably desirable by the market, um, and then opportunities to put knock-ins before uh, then differentiating these cells to do what it is we want them to do in the future. Um, and again, this course offering has a guide sequence data pack that comes with it. All the data you would need to make sure that your filing has a complete story to uh, sort of assess the risks around this type of technology. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, and then of course I'm quality assurance, so I couldn't do a presentation without doing a little bit of GMP, and GMP of course is dear, dear and dear to some of our hearts that are in the, in the room. Uh, but of course the rules uh, and regulations increase as you go down the product life cycle from a discovery to development to maybe eventual commercial. The, the, the risks get bigger because the impact to patients actually is becoming more and more real. And I find this idea of, of uh, increasing stringency is really a good concept, but it's not really an analog thing. I, I like to build little risk assessments using the uh, regulations that are available. And when we're ready to say we've fulfilled that, fulfilled that block, we turn it to a yes, and then we gradually get all these yes, no answers to become an overall uh, high scoring scorecard against our requirements that are laid out to us in the regulatory groups. But we do need to make sure that we build that sort of analog ramp uh, from our, our, uh, our systems that are supporting our products. And there's also a few uh, concepts I want to bring, bring about is uh, with cell and gene therapies and some of the real advanced uh, biologics that are coming out, uh, certainly lately, they've introduced this sort of third way of developing of a, of a product. And I think the first, I don't know what you guys got for that question about how many cell and genes are in the market. I initially said three, because my head was only about the first two um, cell therapies and that first gene therapy from Spark that I, in my head, I corrected myself, of course. But I know that they had a lot more leeway. They came to approval. And they had invented this sort of purple fashion where you start off with a research-only project when you're doing development, and then you have this GMP light which sometimes people talk about, uh, or GMP path is how we describe it here. And I think they had an extended runway of that from the regulators, because the regulators recognize the big potential of these drugs, these types of drugs. I think no longer is that freedom gonna be offered. This is still a strategy that can be pursued. I just think it's gonna be a harder battle, an uphill battle, when it comes to doing your discussions with the regulators. So uh, shortening that GMP path or eliminating it uh, are the other two options uh, that are there. So option one is the traditional way of just turning the GMP switches on fully. Option two is an extended period of GMP light. And option three, I think, is the future of us uh, operating uh, in this space for going forward, which is a shortened version of this GMP path. Uh, but this is just really about how many of those yes, no answers on that regulation uh, are you meeting today? Um, so that midway is having a bit more of a song and dance, a story, uh, and a better story is built if it's using the language that is you know, the, the regulators use, and that's where I think QBD vision really comes in quite nicely. Um, 
So here we are with our operating systems and our guides. So we have our uh, Nuclease, which is built uh, with the concept of that first strategy, where it is ready to go. The operating system has uh, meant to be uh, that first strategy. When it comes down to our guides and our apps, some of them are going to be straight up uh, uh, applications that we've already done off the shelf, and the other ones will be custom. So the custom will need some bit of more leeway. So that strategy two has been in there. And then any sort of uh, templates that we have to also develop inside, we'll also be leveraging that sort of third strategy, which gives us a little more leeway, but we'll have to do a little more song and dance in order to communicate that to our clients. Okay, and how are we using QBD Vision? So this is uh, something that I'm glad I'm third in this uh, panel of sequence, or, or fourth, sorry, but the third one to present how a customer is using QBD Vision. So hopefully you, you can understand that, you know, when it comes to doing your regulatory, regulatory filings, you have to, of course, put a process flow diagram together, and that's easily done by QBD Vision software. And I'll be honest with you guys, we are in our second month of our three-month pilot, so this is really quite high level, not very detailed, but this is straight out of our pilot uh, program. So we put together our, our three unit operation main uh, titles here, and we're trying to fill in uh, all the gaps that we see. But really quite through this process, you get to easily highlight, uh, certainly to the developers, and then communicate out to a broader audience the risks that are involved when it comes to doing a development uh, project in this field. Of course, uh, we'll add together the left side of this, which is going to be your materials and your process, uh, uh, process components, along with our corresponding uh, quality attributes, both on the material attribute side and the process component side. And again, further be able to demonstrate the value of the work that they're doing in the day-to-day -day activities based on the fact that these are important to uh, the overall project. And of course, the last thing to do is to figure out the impact on the outputs of a process, which will be your intermediate quality attributes and your final quality attributes, which is really clearly easily done by this software, which I quite enjoy. We are still, as I said, uh, finishing our second month of evaluating, so we haven't really got through a whole process ourselves, but we find that this kind of a strategy, of course, will focus our efforts from a development group uh, in, and to not waste time, not waste efforts. And our customers who are going to pay for our products will hopefully recognize that we are more efficient at turning an idea into an actual product if we have a framework to, be, to base it on and direct, hey, if you turn left or right here, no, the data says we should turn left. Uh, sometimes the data says go straight, uh, but certainly we want to stay away from going right. Uh, and then the last piece, which I really enjoy, and of course this is nowhere as complex as what Yash showed yes, this morning, is our live pilot version of our risk map, which is incredible. This is a piece that I think uh, should be very colorful throughout the entire development cycle. We don't want it to be all green. We want to see yellows, we want to see reds. And it tells you where your weak parts are in your process. And there's always going to be a weak part. I don't know where anyone, certainly when I first started in pharma, I always wanted greens all the way up and down. And of course, if you're reporting your financials, you want to be green all the way through. Certainly your KPIs at the end of the year. But when it comes to doing a development of project, you need to know where your weak spots are. You need to communicate that to not only internal groups, but customers and say, hey, by the way, we're really clever. We just didn't solve this problem. Please continue on and be aware of that when you go forward with this. Um, and I think it's also useful to do that when you're uh, having conversations with the regulators. If, if regulators understand that you know where your risks are, they're a lot more comfortable. They really don't like it if you don't recognize your own risks. And that's where you get lots more conversations that are more challenging. So in sum summary, we are trying to be a one-stop shop for CRISPR-enabled cell and gene therapies. Uh, we believe we offer a uh, sort of non-exclusive novel technology that'll help expand the use of this CRISPR technology uh, throughout the field of cell and gene therapy. We have our operating systems, we have ready-made applications, and we can custom develop uh, using the same tool sets we use to make our off-the-shelf applications to help with custom add-ins or uh, custom knockouts uh, by our customers, whatever they need. Um, and eventually, we'll of course be using the same platform um, for our own candidates. Thank you very much for your kind attention today. Hello, everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about QBD Vision, um, knowledge management, using uh, flexible plas platform processes um, with our antibody, um, gene therapy, and cell therapy projects. 
Um, so agenda today, um, we're going to talk about why we're implementing um, QB Division at Bayer, um, talk briefly about platform approach in QB Division, um, go into a little bit more depth of antibodies, and also for um, cell therapy. So the question is, why implement QB Division at Bayer, and what's the right way to do CMC? Um, so we're going to talk ab about um, process development. Um, and basically, um, when we start for process development, um, we don't know a whole lot about our product. Um, you know, we'll have some information, but we need to accomplish a lot of risk assessments, um, record a bunch of knowledge. Um, basically, that's coming initially from development, and then as the product goes through maturity, um, we're going to be increasing that knowledge through process characterization, um, a lot of studies that go on. Um, then we build and build and create more and more documents um, throughout the product life cycle, and eventually, um, hopefully, we get to BLA submission and commercial launch. Um, updating these documents is really a pain. Um, it's, there's so many of them. You have cross-functional teams all working together. It's difficult to keep track of what's going on. Um, it's easy to make mistakes between all the documents. Um, you can see, you know, you have some documents that just have like hundreds of rows of data. Um, these data need to be double, triple checked to make sure that they're accurate. Um, and then there's no really standards for the naming of things. Um, each group or each site um, will have its different way of naming things. Um, so it's kind of this is our, our legacy CMC process. Um, and then, um, you know, the question is, is, you know, we want this better solution um, where we can have all of our data in one place. These documents um, ideally don't even need to exist, um, and we can reuse the things that are already there and create um, automated reporting out of things. So that's what we're trying to do, and that's why uh, we're implementing QBD Vision. Um, so we're having a, a shift in the way of how we're doing things, going from documents to, to an application. Um, so we have this um, you know, SaaS service with QBD Vision, which is web-based, and one can just log in, which is great. Um, has versioning and audit trails all included. And the biggest thing is that we've you know, aligned it with our taxonomy. So we have a taxonomy that we created. Um, Yoshko talked a little about that earlier. Um, and that's really kind of key and helpful um, for doing this activity. Um, so in the first row, we have process descriptions, tech transfer reports, um, other types of documents. Currently, those all exist as PDFs um, stored in a server. What we want is we want them all in one integrated solution um, where everyone can access them. Um, right now, we're doing sort of an interim approach where we are pulling the data out of QB Division, um, putting it into Excel, and then um, you know, incorporating into the kind of pre-existing um, documents that are being used. Ideally, we want to kind of get away from that and then have just everything in QB Division as a process version that is then reviewed um, and you know, it, it just lives there online. Um, and then we also have all these uh, risk assessments. Um, currently, those are done in Excel. You know, everything gets an RPN number. Um, but you know, in QB Division, you're allowed to link um, the process parameters to the CQAs um, in a dynamic way. Um, and that's kind of you know, what we're, we're going for. Um, and the process maps, currently those are drawn by hand, basically, in PowerPoint or Visio or whatever program. Um, but we want those in you know, the interactive process maps. Um, and ideally, um, in the future, those would be able to uh, indicate linkages in between different process operations or in, in steps and things like that um, for our other digital applications. Um, so yeah, so now I'm going to talk briefly about the platform approach. Um, Yoshka and John have already gone through this kind of in depth, um, but I'll just kind of briefly talk, touch a few things um, is why we need a platform. Um, the, the drug discovery uh, pipeline is very long. There's lots of projects in there. Um, you know, having a platform approach will allow us to put the process knowledge in there, so if somebody has to either leave the company or switch to another modality or something like that, that knowledge will still be around and useful for people. Um, and then in addition, um, we're working on new modalities of cell and gene therapy. And then um, you know, the FDA is looking for a lot more control of the CMC for the manufacturing of those, of those products. 
um, compared to like what used to happen with antibodies or previous um, products. Um, so we're trying to use this platform approach um, that will allow us to quickly um, basically you know, chug through the, the projects as they come through our pipeline. Um, and hopefully that will improve um, the agency approvals for the new um, cell and gene therapies. So I'm gonna go through uh, briefly the, the antibody platform. Um, so generic antibody process, starting with the cell bank, um, you're you know, expanding those cells, growing those in bioreactors, antibody is secreted, then the cells are impurities, so then they're removed. Um, and then that's the upstream part of things and the downstream part of things, those antibodies in, go through columns, different columns do different things, but um, you basically have a bunch of columns, you'll have a viral inactivation and filtration, and then a kind of a fill finish at the end. So um, kind of what we've done is, um, did it show up? Is it all blank? Oh, well, I guess uh, we'll have to, uh, each one of those will, should have the unit operations and then the different steps there. So, um, so basically in the upstream part, we have um, the options to do fed batch or perfusion. Um, the clarification, we have uh, several different options there. Um, and then the downstream, it's pretty much um, standardized, except when you get to the polishing step that way you can have anti exchange, cation exchange, or uh, mixed mode. So then um, what, what we do is we can just switch um, those around as needed for the projects. Um, so what we did is we put that all into QB division. So um, on the left there, so we have our, our platform there where we just basically have the different options there. It's like we have a one and a two. And the idea is that when you copy that over, Basically, the end user will just select which one they want and then archive the one they don't want. So all your process knowledge is saved in the platform. And then um, for each project, you know, then it becomes very specific for that project. Um, so yeah, so then I'm going to hand it over now to Amul. Thank you, Justin, for setting us up with a platform approach that you can implement in Kibbe Division. And I am glad to see that it's like minded people think alike and are coming here together because everybody is thinking of the next steps, how to make it a more platform approach. But when it comes to cell therapy, and thanks to Oliver for setting up uh, during our tech transfer subgroup, you must have heard, oh, cell therapy is so complex. I don't know how you can make a platform around it. And it is uh, not like a conventional product that you can just make over and over again. There are so many heterogeneity. So um, just share of hands, I wanted to hear from you if that's the same message you've heard, if there is no platform around cell therapy and you can't make one. <laughs> so, so here's my naive attempt, if you will, to make a first attempt uh, for gen developing a platform approach for cell therapy. And I wanna go high, make it more complex first, and then try to find out if there are any similarities that we can utilize for creating a platform. So first of all, for the ones who already know this is not new, but the ones who are new to it, what exactly is cell therapy? Uh, and Oliver mentioned a little bit of that earlier, so I wanted to give you a little bit more perspective of what we mean by cell therapy. What I'm showing on the left-hand side is an immune cell-based process. Uh, immune cells are part of your white blood cells uh, in your blood which uh, compose of T cells, NK cells, uh, and many other uh, cell types that make your peripheral blood mononuclear cells. If you are starting with one single patient and returning the product back to the same patient, that is what makes it as an autolog, as shown on the left-hand side in the uh, green box. Uh, if on the right-hand side is an allogeneic process where it is similar to a conventional antibody or uh, process where you make one product that can be distributed to multiple patients. And it's a complete paradigm shift when it comes to autologous that you start with the patient cell as your starting material. There is no such thing as a cell bank. Uh, you are going through the same journey to get to the same outcome for that patient. And that journey is broken down into a few unit operations, utilizing the terminology that we have in QB division. Uh, the first one is either an autologous or an allogeneic patient. You uh, go through a leukophoresis, 
collect those peripheral blood mononuclear cells and separate them into the cell of interest. If you are making CAR T cells, for example, then you would separate out the T cells and remove everything else. Those, if you are making an NK cell based product, then you would start with the NK cells and remove everything else. But the cell of interest that is shown here as an example is T cells, CD4 and CD8 positive are the two different type of uh, CT, T, T cells you can obtain, which then go through the second up step of activating them. The activation is done using activation beads, and those are materials that you can use as part of your process, just put, putting planting seeds in your brain one step at a time. Uh, there are multiple cytokines as media components that you can use to grow them. Uh, when they, when, if you're using it for any specific indication, then you want the cells to be activated, but also transduced to be gene modified for a specific indication that you are trying to treat in that specific patient. Otherwise, the patient would have been able to cure it himself or herself. This gene modification is what makes it more unique. Uh, then you grow those cells, uh, filter out anything else that the patient would uh, find it harmful, and return it back to the same patient. So that, in a nutshell, is an immune cell-based process. When you then take it to the next step of looking at stem cells, stem cells are something that are present in uh, umbilical cord, in an embryo, uh, or in the bone marrow. So these cells have the capability, and it's called pluripotency, have the capability of differentiating into different cell types. If you go uh, from the right, we look at nerve cells, those can be differentiated into dopaminergic neurons for Alzheimer's, for example. Uh, the intestinal cells can be utilized for any gut-related indications. If, you, if I switch to the left, look at liver cells, you can make hepatocytes for uh, different uh, chronic uh, diseases that are in the liver uh, prone. Muscle cells, an example is cardiomyocytes, which are utilized for any strokes or any heart-related uh, issues. And what you see in the middle is blood cells, which if you take a step back, I just talked about was immune cells being a part of blood cell. So now if you take a look uh, at a bigger picture, you can see there are similarities. There are similarities in what cell type you are using, what cell modifications you are doing, and where you are taking your product next step. Can we, can we utilize this information to now start thinking of creating a platform process around these. But wait, how do I build a platform that is such heterogeneous? And is there a way I can go about step by step? So in the next seven to eight slides, if the boxes actually show up, uh, <laughs> if not, I will share the slides with you uh, to be seen afterwards. Uh, what, yeah. <laughs> So this is trade secret, <laughs> and, and, and that is why it's hidden. But no, I, I will walk you through some of the steps, and you can see the slides afterward. The attempt here is to see, use those unit operations that you saw on the immune cell process and build building block. I will visualize, verbally visualize it for you. What you see on the swim lane, uh, trying to go across the swim lanes, is building blocks. You start with the starting material on the left-hand side. You go through a gene modification as a unit operation. You grow those cells, and you finally formulate, package them into a product that you can give them to the patient. In between, there are sub-steps that are necessary to go from one step to another. So that, the, what you don't see here is starting with an immune cell going into a um, T cell activation and enrichment process, going into a lentiviral based transduction method. And as you heard earlier, gene therapy is uh, pivotal for any viral based process. That becomes a critical reagent as a raw material when it comes to cell therapy. So that's what is the gene modification. You grow those uh, cells, you formulate them in, and prepare it in a dosage form that can be given back to the patient. Now that is trying to set up one layer, one process, one unit operation based process that you can take it as a subset. But wait, there's more. What you can do 
is use everything else that was similar, but in, in this case, in case instead of doing T cell uh, base activation, I can switch that unit operation into an NK cell unit operation where I only want the NK cell of interest and I'm getting rid of the other cells. So, but everything else remains more or less the same. Now, taking it to the next step further, we looked at activation. Activation are different uh, reagents and different media that you can use, but more or less the unit operation is similar. Uh, the reagents become materials. So that is a platform unit operation I can use to leverage into future processes. The three boxes that you see in, in the middle are gene modification processes. The first one I talked about is lentiviral-based uh, gene modification. The second one you heard from Steve a little bit was on electroporation, which is a non-viral-based uh, method. You can use that as a delivery vehicle for gene editing, as, as Steve explained in uh, great detail, but you can also use that for any other gene modifications. So those, each of these processes, as you saw from uh, Steve's slide process, is quite complex. And each of those have sub-steps and materials and attributes that are necessary to build, bring in that process into uh, a broader operation if you are talking about cell therapy. Those can then be modified and taken along the same journey to get to the same uh, CAR-T-based process using different approaches. Now that was, if that was complicated enough, that's only one half of my simulant diagram which is using immune cell as your starting point. Remember a few slides ago I showed stem cell can get you to the same point. So if you now ch talk about changing your source of stem cell based process, but you want to get to the same outcome, is that possible? Maybe it is. So if you take a look at immune cell as a starting material, sorry, stem cell as a starting material, you are growing them to be ready for any and all of those gene modifications. Uh, they once are modified into a T cell based approach that you saw earlier. You can then activate them uh, as they are already modified, grow those cells and take it to the same outcome. So as you can see, there are multiple ways to start and, mul and multiple endpoints to get to, but there is commonality in the journey they take. Now, you must have said, okay, all of these talk about only T cell or NK cell gene modification. What about those stem cell for nerve and liver applications that you mentioned earlier? The, for those reasons, if you still want those to be stem cells, you don't have to go through gene modifications. And you can have an option to switch out that operation with something else or allow the cells to grow. And then uh, using different differentiation protocols modify those stem cells into a different lineage uh, as either ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm. Ectoderm makes your skin, makes your uh, nerves. Mesoderm is, uh, makes a lot of your chondrocytes and your bone uh, tissue. And endoderm makes all of your visceral organs like liver and heart and uh, others. So any of those differentiation protocol can still lead you to a similar outcome, but from a CMC standpoint, your process has a lot of commonality that you can utilize to build from one step to another. Now, if you take all of those things combined, this can get quite complicated, but if you build one step at a time, like someone said uh, yesterday, think big, start small, and, and do one unit operation at a time, characterize that uh, unit operation build in your material, and, now, and with the copy function that QB Division has very well established, you can utilize a benchmark process to make versions of your future process. And if you build all of these capabilities into each unit operation, what you'll hear tomorrow is system libraries. And not about material libraries, but unit operation libraries and all of the characterization that you've done for that unit operation can then help you get, take it for creating these libraries of unit operations that can help you build a platform. So I was lying this whole time. It's not a platform. It's a conglomerate of platform processes that you can use for creating multiple different processes. 
So, and that's why I said, think big, start small. What, but what, one thing you'll notice here is those swim lanes that I showed had orthogonal unit operations. You can go left or you can go right. Currently, today, that's not an option in Kibbe Division, although they, you are working on developing those. So what we've done to represent here, and thanks to Justin for his creativity, is numbered them so you can then choose later on where you have orthogonal unit operations. Right now, they're showing serially, but once that capability is available, then you can see them orthogonally and have that capability to show from a platform approach how it can be applied. So with that, I wanted to uh, conclude this talk by saying that a flexible platform approach not only saves time and resources for creating new projects, but also helps build on existing process knowledge that you've built over these unit operations and help collaborate and standardize using the right taxonomy as a starting point for setting up these uh, processes and then promote understanding of external projects as you are partnering, as you work with another collaborator who can speak the same language and is on the same platform. This check transfer process would be much easier if you have access to their process in your cloud and vice versa. So that's, that's where we are taking. Potential next steps is to build these shared libraries, add data analytics, and create uh, examples like process description tech transfers for easy outputs for regulatory submissions. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you.